Right. Well, Chase, I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. Not only am I married to a man, but I'm also the mom of three young adult boys. So, uh, so you immediately have my attention when you talk about even what is healthy masculinity and what does it look like to ma- mature as a man. So thank you for doing this work. I feel like a lot of people are sort of without a compass when it comes to this. Yeah, well, I'm really grateful for the conversation. And particularly, you know, I've had a lot of women read the book uh, from your position as moms or spouses. And uh, I really have, a, I wrote the book, obviously, for men, but I think this this challenge men are facing, we all bear responsibility and we all play a role. And so uh, I do think it's important cultural conversation beyond just men. So I'm really grateful for you taking the time with the book and also for this conversation. Yeah. Well, how how did I guess the background and history of the conversation around toxic masculinity and most recently like the Barbie movie and just you know all this about uh what is healthy masculinity how did that play into your desire um to create a book that actually gives us a better roadmap So first and foremost I'm a pastor I have a congregation of men and I pastor a, a fairly small congregation 120 130 people which means I I know most of the people in my congregation mm-hmm. personally and I have a lot of young men in my congregation. And what I was finding was uh, a lot of them were wrestling with questions around what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a Christian man? And I think perhaps the thing that concerned me the most was they were just finding it harder to have that conversation. The conversation itself, uh, manhood, the word masculinity, I put it in the title of a book and found out very quickly, everyone has strong opinions. It can be controversial. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the negative thing that has happened is we're having fewer and fewer conversations around masculinity and what it means to be a man because those conversations can feel risky or dangerous. Perhaps I'm going to say something wrong or somebody's going to take something the wrong way. And so it's been this strange moment. I'm, I'm raising a son and a daughter, and I've seen how open our culture is to having conversations around what it means to be a woman today, what are the expectations of the role of women. But at that very same time, it's feeling riskier, and we're having fewer conversations around what it means to be a man. And my experience is our culture has kind of held out two options. There's the traditional masculinity is toxic and it needs to be deconstructed and we need to build a new form of masculinity. But then I was also observing a kind of reaction to that, um, particularly seeing it a lot on social media and some of the, the influential cultural voices speaking to men was a kind of reaction that said, no, your raw masculinity is your, I call it salvific, it's your salvation. You need to indulge mm. those masculine impulses. You need to lean into kind of raw, bare masculinity. And that's who you're supposed to be. And the thing that struck me about both of those views is both of them were really about the external expectations of men, the role that they should play, how they should behave, how they should act, what they should be interested in. And uh, both sides were sort of digging those trenches deeper, the sort of masculinity is toxic or masculinity is salvific. And the thing fewer and fewer people were talking about was, and this is where I think most men I knew pastorally were living was, well, how do I just become a better man? Uh, yeah. How do I grow in character and be a better husband, a better father, a, a better participant in my church? Uh, and these cultural conversations we're having, they they really aren't giving paths for men to just improve and grow in character. We're sort of getting stuck in the debate and men really weren't making progress forward and having fewer conversations about it. So for me, the, I came to the conversation primarily pastorally, wanting to just help the men in my congregation try to carve a path forward in what felt like increasing controversy. Yeah, I I love that description. Probably about six or eight months ago, I interviewed Nancy Piercy on her book on toxic masculinity and had a great conversation with her. And one of our listeners contacted me afterward and said, I love that conversation, but I still don't feel like I have a picture of what healthy masculinity is. Like, what are we actually shooting for? Understanding the historical context and having these debates Uh, is helpful at some level. But if we don't have uh, a path forward, I think both men and women feel like we're kind of stuck. And that sounds like that's what you've seen as well. Yeah, C.S. Lewis actually had this analogy that I use in the book where he says that um, he talked about the three questions of morality, and he drew an analogy to a a fleet of of naval vessels trying to leave one port and reach another port across an ocean. And he said there were three things that they would need. Uh, The first question of morality is what are we aiming at? Where are we trying to go? What is that distant port we're trying to arrive at? 
uh, all the ships have to have the same goal. But he said the second question was uh, they have to be able to coordinate their maneuvers, that these ships sailing together have to be able to communicate. They have to be able to, to, to make moves that are safe or else they'll be colliding into one another. And Lewis compared that to the external moral behavior. So if we're going to live in this society, there are certain moral expectations for us as men, how to behave in the workplace, how to behave as fathers, how to participate in neighborhoods and communities. And that's where I think most of the conversation is happening right now, this whole conversation around toxic masculinity. But Lewis said the third question, and he said the one that is often neglected, I think that's proved prophetic, is the question about these ships may know where they're going. They may communicate all their maneuvers, but if they haven't maintained the vessels, if the vessels aren't operating and working as they're supposed to, they won't be able to pull off those maneuvers. So Lewis says if they're, they have shoddy rudders, they may know where they want to go and how to get there, but they'll still be colliding with one another. And for Lewis, mm -hmm. this was the idea of, as men, we have to be able to have personal growing character. Uh, we have to be developing the kind of skills necessary to bear responsibility. And that to me seems to be, we have a lot of conversations with men about the kinds of responsibility they should bear, how they should be fathers and how they should be husbands. But we don't equip them with the internal lessons, the skills, the character formation that allows them to bear those responsibilities. And we know that, um, how many of us have home gyms with weights that we purchased, but we've still not quite reached the point of being able to live, yeah. right? Yeah. We know that it takes a certain amount of discipline to bear greater weight, but sometimes we put that weight on men and assume, them, assume they can just carry it when they haven't mm -hmm. cultivated the character necessary to bear that responsibility. And mm -hmm. I think that's um, what your listener was alluding to as well. I, I see the role I should be playing. I see what it looks like to be a Christian godly man, but how do I how do I actually, me, myself, grow in the kind of character necessary to live that way and to be that kind of man? And as you mentioned, this is not only instructive to men, but it's helpful for parents and for wives and um, for church, the church at large to say, all right, we're part of that work um, of having a shared vision of what maturity looks like. Um, so your book is called The Five Masculine Instincts. And let me start off just by reading these five instincts and then making a few comments about them. So sarcasm, adventure, ambition, reputation, and apathy, which we'll get into just spending a little bit of time in each of those five. But the first thought I had when I read through those was there, and this is probably partly because of the work that I do, like there's nothing about sex. Like when I think about men and their instincts it's anger and sex. And that, you know, that's sort of how we've addressed the toxic masculinity and like these seem to be inborn uh, drives for men. But I, I'd love for you to unpack how maybe we're misunderstanding instincts and how you're defining them. And even how the ones that you named actually will end up playing out in how we handle things like sexuality, relationships, anger, things like that. So that that's my, my first thought that I'd love for you to bounce off of. Sure. So uh, I use the definition from Lewis again for instincts as behavior, as if from knowledge, that there are certain patterns of behaving that we assume we've thought through that are common sense, that are logical, and we act upon them as if we've decided when in reality, we probably never stop to consider why we do the things we do. And um, I think we can see this in, in various ways. Two men may lie for very different reasons. That's the same sin. But one man may lie because he's indifferent of another person and wants to, to get rid of them. I'll lie to sort of dismiss the situation. Another may lie to protect their reputation or to try to impress someone. Um, and I think that goes with our sexuality as well, too. I mean, you've done enough work in this and listening to your podcast uh, are keenly aware that our, our instinct for for our sexual appetite can be driven by very different things. Uh, mm. It can come from an insecurity. It can come from past wounds. It can, uh, it can be driven by different impulses. This sort of need for sex isn't the same thing for every single person in every situation. Yeah. And so I think a lot of these are symptoms of the fact that we've never really paid close attention to this under the neath logic of what we're pursuing, these instincts that are driving those behaviors. And what I tried to do in the book was help men wrestle and sort of ask some questions about, well, why do I want those things? Why do mm -hmm. I crave those things? Why, why are there certain pursuits that are so meaningful to me? Um, 
And the five that I use in the book are, and I say this in the book, I don't think they're exhaustive. Um, if I wrote at the end of the book, I think if you said, well, wait a minute, there's a sixth instinct you forgot. Fair enough. Really, the book's about trying to help men develop that skill, right? Let's come back to that idea of these disciplines of introspection to pay attention to why do I do the things that I do? Uh, but the five instincts that, that you mentioned, they actually come from uh, one of Shakespeare's monologues. There's a famous line people will be familiar with from the play, um, as you like it, that says, um, uh, all the world's a stage and each of us have our entrance and our exits. And a man in his day plays several parts. And Shakespeare goes on to describe in, in his telling there are seven stages, the first being birth and the last being death. Uh, but in between are these five stages in which he depicts this from a school age boy all the way through to what we might imagine as kind of retirement years. And he gives this image. And in each of those images, there's this kind of underlying logic for how that man is living and what's important to him. And I noticed really quickly that some of those some of those images that Shakespeare were depicting, I could see in the characters of the Bible. I could see in the lives and sometimes characters would have more than one of those. But for each of those instincts, I tried to identify a biblical character and use that biblical story to unpack and help men maybe explore, could that instinct, that way of living or thinking be driving my behavior right now beneath the surface without me recognizing it? Mm -hmm. And once I do recognize it, I think it's important to say these instincts are not necessarily sinful. I think that's one of the traps. You know, we always, when we talk about men, want to talk about money, sex, and power. Yeah. Uh, and this is trying to push that conversation a little bit lower and say, okay, but are there these instincts that in my opinion are, are neither, are not sinful, they're neutral. These instincts can be, and I use examples where they can be for good, but if we're blind to these instincts, they do have a tendency to lead us down paths of destruction and to awaken those desires in us that will lead to destruction. So really, mm -hmm. these instincts are about trying to explore what is that, that behavior as if from knowledge, that behavior that I've never really wrestled with where that comes from in my life. Mm -hmm. And the way you describe Shakespeare's presentation of this, are these instincts developmental? In other, in other words, like is the first one sort of the thing you need to address in your early adulthood all the way through the last one being this is a struggle of the person who's retiring? Yeah, Shakespeare definitely has them that way. He has from birth to death these stages. And it's been interesting as I've as I I think a person could could jump around. I think there are certain life events that could lead you from directly from, let's say, sarcasm into kind of apathy. I think there's a lot of cultural apathy happening that that may not be related just to that sort of retirement age, as we'll talk about it. Um, but I do. It's interesting. The more I, I speak and I've got an online assessment on my website where guys can answer questions and kind of see which of these instincts might be strongest. And I do often find that in our youth, it is this instinct of sarcasm and that as we begin to age, that drive for adventure takes over and eventually it gives way to this, this need for reputation uh, and ambition and then ultimately the sort of apathy that is common as we age. I, I do find more often than not um, that stage of life you're in, there, it's at least you should be aware or wise mm -hmm. to these Shakespearean stages because they've proven in my experience to often be true. Yeah, uh, good point. Well, you mentioned apathy. Let's dive right in there. And uh, when I first hear apathy, I think, or I'm sorry, let me go back. Well, let's dive in. You mentioned sarcasm as the first one. And uh, when I hear that word sarcasm, it's actually hard for me to imagine how that could be value neutral or even good. You know, a lot of times in my experience, sarcasm is sort of snarky. And uh, so what do you mean by sarcasm? Is it is it more than sarcasm? Is it is it sort of folly or or humor, like all that stuff encompassed? Yeah, men always get really uncomfortable with this one because I'm going to steal their sarcasm. And if you take sarcasm <laughs> from a group of guys, what else do they have left to talk about, right? Like, don't take my, my sense of humor from me. Uh, there are places I think you get sarcasm in scripture, particularly in the prophets where they're using sarcasm. I think God himself at times will even sort of taunt some of the idols of the world in, in forms of sarcasm. There's a certain kind of sarcasm that can actually mm -hmm. uh, break through and make points that perhaps by just mere logic you couldn't make. But we all know there's a kind of sarcasm that is a contempt for authority. And the way that I tell that story is through the story of Cain from Genesis. Uh, of course, Cain is the one who has his, his sacrifice rejected by God. His brother Abel is received. And everybody has wrestled with that story by asking the question, why? 
why does God reject Cain's sacrifice and not Abel's? And the scriptures don't really say. It only says that God did not have favor for his sacrifice. But it struck me reading that story that God actually comes down and initiates a conversation with Cain and says, Cain, don't you realize sin is, is lurking at your door? It's this animal waiting to, to devour you if you don't rule over it. And God actually initiates a conversation with Cain, trying to warn him about what's happening in his heart. God, you could say, comes down and offers Cain this divine lesson. And how does Cain respond to that divine lesson, that tutoring from God? Uh, well, he doesn't answer God. He rises up and strikes down his brother, kills his brother Abel. And when God comes to him again and says, where's your brother Abel? He says, am I my brother's keeper? Well, this is sarcasm. He knows exactly mm -hmm. where his brother is. He's murdered him mm -hmm. and hit his body. This answer to God is, is really a contempt for God's authority. And the thing that struck me about Cain is his inability to take a lesson from God, to respect that authority, and to entertain the idea that he might be wrong, that there might be something that he needs to learn. And we all know men, perhaps you are this man, or, or you, perhaps you have a son, or who, who can never take anything seriously, and is always turning anything serious into a kind of joke, always laughing it off. And you start to get a sense that that's not just humor. There's actually a, a, a rebellion, a kind of a rebelling against authority, a rebelling against any authority that might speak or challenge me in my life. And I think that's what you see in Cain. And that's the danger of sarcasm, that it can actually stunt maturity. Uh, we can think everything is, is dumb. Everything is a joke. We can't take anything seriously. And it, and it ruins our ability to mature and grow and to hear those lessons that God himself, that authority of heaven, uh, even sometimes through challenging and difficult lessons is trying to teach us. Mm -hmm. A couple of things come to mind when you say that, just examples. You know, there are whole YouTube channels that all they do is make fun of serious things um, in a, a, a in a in a not good way. It's not just good humor. It's like making fun of people and and it really is like undercutting any form of moral authority. So that's the first thing I thought of. Um but the second thing I thought of that might that may be different and I don't even know if it is a moral authority issue is in a marriage relationship where the man always makes a joke if there's a conflict. And every time the woman raises a subject that she's concerned about his defense mechanism is humor. And uh, in some ways, it's almost like he needs to deflect. He can't handle the the tension of conflict or owning something. And I don't know if that plays into like rebelling against authority, if that's just more like a an immaturity of not being able to hold the responsibility. Yeah, for each of the instincts, I try to pair them with an intentional act that you can use to to check that instinct. So if you are the kind of man, or perhaps people are saying you're the kind of man who can't ever take anything seriously, who's always turning everything into a joke. I mean, what you're describing is always deflecting through attempts mm -hmm. at humor. Then maybe you need some sort of an intentional practice to try and check that, to, to put that, keep that in a proper place. And the one that I offer for uh, sarcasm is humility, which mm -hmm. I like to define as, because humility is a strange one. How do you act out humility, right? We think, we think, well, if I'm not boasting and prideful, then you just sort of get humility. So how can you make humility something active? Uh, the definition I use for humility is self-suspicion. That in that moment where you feel the need to sort of make a joke or make light of something, to, to make fun of something, could you pause for a moment and be suspicious enough of your first impulse, your first reaction to say, no, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's something I need to learn in this moment or hear. Perhaps God is trying to teach me a lesson in this moment, or perhaps my spouse has something that I actually need to hear, I need to take seriously. So in that moment, when you feel that impulse to sort of immediately uh, make light of something, turn something into a joke, could you have enough humility to pause and say, I'm suspicious enough of my first impulse to entertain there might be something here I actually need to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a helpful check. Uh, and perhaps you're right. Maybe maybe the person is wrong, or maybe there is something funny. Uh, uh, we're not trying to kill any sense of humor or joke, but we're at least maturing enough to recognize this may be actually a tool I'm using to avoid things that I actually need to take seriously. And can yeah. I have enough humility, that self-suspicion, to hear those potential lessons when they come? Mm -hmm. Okay, now the, on the other, other side of this, and I probably ask you this for maybe all these instincts, but what happens if you have no sarcasm? Like uh, if your life is devoid of that humor or ability to make things light, 
Yeah, that's really interesting. I don't know if I've uh, nobody's asked me that question from the other direction, but I do think these things are meant to be balanced in our life, right? So all of these instincts, and we'll talk about some of these if we ask this question on the other ones. Um, perhaps we all need a way of framing life with adventure. We all need breaks, you know, which mm -hmm. you could call apathy or it might just be vacations. I'm going to set some things down for a while. And I think sarcasm is one of those too. There are times where we need humor. Humor is a, is a is a powerful tool for being able to put things in perspective. It can be a powerful tool. I think, as I mentioned before, uh, the prophets, Jesus himself at times uses this kind of humor to draw things out. And so the ability to um, to laugh, the ability, I think it's actually a mark of humility as well, too, to sometimes turn that sarcasm on yourself, uh, mm -hmm. to recognize uh, the absurdity of yourself sometimes. I think that can be a really helpful tool for keeping perspective. Uh, yeah. But again, all of these come back to is this thing, let's go back to our definition of an instinct, is this behavior as if from knowledge? Like, am I behaving in ways that I think uh, make sense and are rational when really it's just an instinct and an impulse? Or is this something I've actually matured and now can use for good when it's available? Yeah. And I can speak uh, for my husband, like he's just a funny guy and he makes me laugh almost every day and I'm too serious. And so he's been a great balance for me. I remind him to take things more seriously and he reminds me not to take them so seriously. And even the balance of parenting, like there have been situations where, you know, I get in there and I analyze things to death and take them seriously. And he's like, all right, we need a little levity here. So. Well, what I, a great I, gift of relationships. Cause that's what in my mind, these instincts are meant to be. They're not, I mean, it wouldn't be nice if I could write a book and say, if you have these five instincts, you'll be a man, but that's certainly not what this book is. It's more yeah. about, how do I develop the internal character to regulate these things in my life towards good, towards maturity? I think that's a great description of it yeah. in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay, so adventure. Um, and I love how you've sort of described this because I see this happening in young men who are, you know, starting to settle down, maybe get married. They have a... I have a serious career, a 401k, you know, like all the things they're supposed to do. <laughs> a, a cubicle and a mortgage yes. and a <laughs> and car like, payment. And yeah. Wait, the walls are closing in. What happened to me? Like, where's, where's the sense of fun and risk? And, you know, there, maybe their spouse is saying, I don't want you to take risks and I need you home by five. And, uh, and so I could see how that creates like a crisis of adventure. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So there there are certainly men, and I do worry that as Christians, there's been a kind of narrative of like, men need to, to be masculine, you need to live your life in this narrative of adventure. And there are certainly... There are certainly men who need to live for more, who need to be waken, woken up to what God is doing and construct their life towards a narrative that's meaningful, that might be a, a narrative of adventure. But as you describe it, what I find with a lot of men, and this is particularly true with the cultural narrative that's playing out in most of our movies and, and uh, literature right now, which is the way that you find your true self, your identity is by leaving place and tradition and family and often religion and going out on some sort of an epic quest to test yourself and discover who you really are. And what's happening with a lot of men, as we're describing them, is all of a sudden the realities of life start settling in and they start feeling like, well, I don't know who I am anymore. And I don't know mm -hmm. uh, my place in this world. And the culture says, well, you've been boxed in. You need to, walk, you need to leave all of those things and go find yourself again. And what's happening is it's really weakening men's commitment to, to place, to relationships, to family and marriage and careers. And I use the story of Samson to talk about adventure because Samson seems to have this idea. He's always going on these kind of epic adventure quests, going and testing himself. And there's this idea that these adventures are going to make me more enlightened and more self-actualized, and I'm going to become wiser and more discerning. But through Samson's story, the more of these adventures he goes on, the less discerning he becomes. The, the more he loses himself and his real identity. And in the end, he doesn't end up actualized or, or with this grand sense of his own identity. He, he becomes almost lost and desperate and gives away the final bit of his identity, his hair uh, to Delilah. Everything in his story betrays him. It's not just Delilah. It's this whole pursuit of himself through adventure. And I try to say to men that um, there's a good adventure. There's a place for adventure. I mean, have go go have your adventures. But if it's weakening commitment and faithfulness to relationships and place and faith, then you think it's going to provide something it's probably not. The most meaningful things in life seem to be the things that come 
through consistency and through commitment over time. And that is the joy of a vocation. That is the meaning within marriage itself. That is an appreciation for place, uh, the building of faith over decades. Those things aren't narratives of adventure as much as they are narratives of faithfulness that build. I like to talk about acquired tastes, right? Mm -hmm. They become better the longer you're in them and practicing them. And so I think a lot of us need that check right now, that cultural narrative that adventure is going to make me feel fulfilled and like who I truly am. Well, it's just as likely to lead us into a place of losing all the things that are most meaningful and actually diminishing our sense of who we are than it is mm -hmm. to fulfill those things. Mm -hmm. How do you think this plays out in virtual adventure, like video games and even pornography, where uh, I'm not going to leave my marriage, I'm not going to leave even the confines of my bedroom, uh, but I'm going to go on these virtual adventures, either sexually or with video games, like I can be the hero that defeats the, the giant and things like that. Yeah, I worry a lot about that. And you see that in Samson's story, don't you? That it isn't just the adventure. Intertwined in that adventure is his sexuality, is the sort of, uh, it's not just his physical exploits. It's also, he's constantly pursuing women and romance and, and love. And tied up within that, though, in Samson's story is that need for him to be known. I mean, there's this moment where he's literally, it seems he's lying on Delilah's lap. And it's actually kind of ambiguous. It almost seems like he may intentionally give up the secret to her because yeah. he says to her, I'll find if my hair is cut, I'll, I'll be like every other man. And there's almost a sense of longing in it where he seems to be saying, I just I'm done with all of this distinction of being chosen by God or carrying this sort of I just want to be like everyone else and this fear that I'm sort of missing out. Um, I think there's certainly a lot of that that goes on in, in the secretness of men's lives and in their pursuits, whether it is of, of, of all sorts of fantasies, whether it's video games or pornography or even just daydreams of, of other places and other lives. There's this desire that they're, they're missing out and to be like whatever everyone else and to have what everyone else is having. And then that cultural narrative that says you can have it. I mean, that's the one that concerns me is um, we think we can have everything. We have all mm -hmm. of the technology to have it all the time. And so it does continue to just corrode and eat away at those commitments we've made. And sometimes it does it in ways we don't recognize. But there is always that moment, like in Samson's story, and it's so sad in Samson's story. She cuts his hair. All of a sudden, these assassins pounce on him. And he didn't realize that his strength was gone. He didn't realize the way that this sort of longing within him to give away those things had robbed him and corroded him of who he actually was. And I think that's happening in a lot of men's lives. The addictions are eroding away who they are. And there comes a moment of crisis, that moment of betrayal, when we realize all of those things we've been searching for, for meaning, they don't fulfill, but they in the end betray us. And it's not just us betraying our commitments. It's the things we've been trusting that don't produce what we thought they would as well. And there are these moments of collapse where all the things that we thought had given us structure and stability they're not what they were because we've eroded them through these other longings, these other desires, these adventures. I think that's a real problem for many men today. Mm -hmm. They may not be leaving to go on some hiking yeah. through the Appalachians, yeah. but that desperate need for desire is corroding and eating away at their life, even in secrecy. Mm -hmm. And sort of uh, an antithesis, it would be even like uh, John Eldridge's Wild at Heart, where his thesis is men aren't getting enough real adventure. And so they're falling for the wrong adventure or they're shutting down their masculinity. And I'd love for you to speak about that. Like, is there an instinct within men, maybe uniquely within men that is built to take risks uh, for the right reasons and where men are becoming too paralyzed or passive to actually step into the adventures that God might have for them? Yeah, we're going to talk about that when we get to apathy. I think there's a okay. certain type of man that needs to wake up, get up off the couch and go do something with their life. There is a kind of apathy that can rob you of that meaning. But I do get and look, I'm an outdoorsman. I love to, to hunt and fish and we sail and I'm, I'm, I like adventure. So there, there's nothing wrong with going and having fun outside in some adventure. But I do worry when we construct those narratives of meaning, what's going to produce meaning in my life away from things like my faith, the sacrifice for neighbors and the community that I serve, the raising of my children, the serving and loving of a spouse. We need those things to carry the significance of adventure. 
And, and I do worry that as Christian men, we have bought a little too into this narrative that, well, I need to go have adventures so I can be a certain kind of person and then I'll be a good husband, then I'll be a good father. Um, I would rather see us connecting that, the meaningfulness of that adventure into those actual commitments of place and family and relationships and construct those as the narrative. What gives mm -hmm. my life meaning, as much as I may love adventure, is I'm a father to two children. Yeah. I'm a spouse. I'm pastoring a congregation where I've dedicated my life to these people. And through commitment, you may feel initially like that's mm -hmm. the cubicle and that's the mortgage payment that's holding you back. But over time, I think you actually begin to realize those are the most meaningful pursuits of life. And they do have a, a narrative structure of adventure in them. And I think you can't fully appreciate that without commitment, which means you do mm -hmm. sacrifice other things, personal pursuits, for the sake of investing in these. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think there are certain men who need, it to, need to construct their lives into a greater adventure narrative. But I think that's done best when it's done in these deep, these commitments of, of place and of faith and of relationships. Yeah. And perhaps a good biblical example of that is Daniel. You know, like we read these highlights of his life, uh, like these great epic adventures like the lion's den, which we wouldn't, none of us would want to have to go through. But like it's the drama. But if you read the whole story of Daniel, like this is over the course of over eight decades. And how many years and decades was he just faithful to pray three times a day and yeah. to do the work David's in life front of mostly looked like just bowing in a window, praying every day. That yeah. was the adventure. Well, that's an interesting point because I do think commitment to place and family and church, I think those are quickly becoming in our culture, very countercultural ways of living. Mm -hmm. So I do think, particularly as the years are going by, to be a father, to be a husband, to be a church member, to love your neighbors that is going to take a certain amount of adventurous mm -hmm. lifestyle to just keep those priorities in this culture that prioritizes them less and less. So yeah, I think Daniel's a really interesting way of putting that as well mm -hmm. too. The adventure, the real adventure doesn't always look like or feel like adventure, yeah. right? And there, there's little pockets of it, you know, like if you have a teenager, you're going to have some <laughs> form of adventure at some point. But, you know, again, in Daniel's life, um, most of his life was characterized by just faithful steadfastness, yep. but we focus on these few events that are just really dramatic. And I think that happens in every life. There's there's drama when it needs to be there. We don't. Need to um, I it. use the story from uh, Lord of the Rings where Frodo and Sam are are nearing Mount Mordor to destroy the ring. Uh, guys, love this is nerdy nerdy uh, <laughs> illustration, but there's this really interesting scene in the book where Frodo just cannot go on anymore, and he starts cursing the whole endeavor. You know, this is uh, the ground and the air and this ring, and uh, there's nothing in it that is feeling adventurous and fun anymore. And Sam, his friend, says, perhaps this is how all true adventures really are, that the people in them never feel like they're adventures at all. And I wonder what kind of tale we've fallen into. And I think it's so, it's so profoundly wise because he's making the point, an adventure never feels adventurous in the middle of it. Yeah. And that's what I think is true about being mm -hmm. a father, and being a husband, and serving a place and a church. And those may not feel like adventure. But that's because you're in the middle of the story and you haven't realized how that's going to play out and what will come of that sacrifice you're making. Um, we need friends like Sam to say, hey, maybe this is what adventure actually feels like. Maybe in yeah. the middle of the adventure, it's not all that exciting. It is mm -hmm. Daniel just praying every day at a window. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a great perspective. Ambition is the third one. Uh, and you define ambition in a way that shows us that the other, like one side of ambition is actually inadequacy. So it's not just the person who is working 80 hours a week and has to succeed, but it can also be the man who is paralyzed by the, the fear of failure uh, and inadequacy. So, uh, so talk about that and even where that might fit within the lifespan of the average man. Yeah, I think that's really important, the points you make as well, too, because I think a lot of men would look at their life and say, I'm not ambitious because I'm not. CEO of a company. I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, leading some movement. But ambition is really, in my mind, and particularly this instinct of ambition, living in this sort of behavior of ambition means I have set up some vision of my future self for the great thing that I'm going to accomplish. And now everything in my life is measured against my pursuit of that goal. So for one man, that may feel empowering, particularly at the beginning, right? This is this great thing that I'm going to accomplish and I'm motivated by it. 
But for another man who feels like he's falling short of that goal and not measuring up, his life may not feel ambitious at all, but he's still living out of this, this idea of ambition that his life is defined and meaning is defined by his progress towards that goal or even his, his lack of progress mm -hmm. towards that goal. And I use the story of Moses to talk about this. Um, Moses is, uh, spends his whole life in this pursuit uh, of trying, you know, at the very beginning, he strikes down the Egyptian and believes that the people are going to rally around him and they'll, he'll lead them out of freedom. And all of a sudden, uh, this is this pivotal moment of ambition, right? He acts on this ambition. And what happens? They end up mocking him. Who made you prince over us? And he flees into the wilderness. And so another 40 years go by, and all of a sudden at the burning bush, God calls him to go to Egypt, speak to Pharaoh, and free the people. And you would think Moses would jump at this opportunity. That's the very thing I tried to do 40 years ago and failed. And look, now God's calling me to it again. But all of a sudden Moses says, well, I'm slow of speech, and I can't mm -hmm. do it. And eventually says, can't you just get someone else? And you think in this moment, Moses is the least ambitious person imaginable, when in reality, he's still defining himself by his own failures and his inability to live up to that. He's still, it's this future goal in measuring myself. And Moses wrestles with that. He gets, um, after the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, he gets so tired and fed up with these people because it's not going the way he imagined. They're constantly grumbling and wandering in the wilderness. And God sends him out and tells him once again to speak to this rock and provide water for the people. And Moses gathers the Israelites and he says, listen, you rebels. Must we produce water from this rock? And he strikes the rock. And everybody remembers he disobeys by striking the rock. But I think it's as much about what he says that God hadn't given him to say as it is the action. He just loses it with these people and begins to chastise them. And he's frustrated by them. And because of this, God will take Moses up on Mount Nebo and show him the promised land. And he'll tell Moses, but you will die here and you will not lead these people into the promised land. I mean, this is the thing Moses has been at, the great ambition from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And what's always amazed me about Moses is his ability to set it down, that he doesn't come down grumbling or complaining or angry at God. He goes down and preaches the book of Deuteronomy and encourages the people to remember God's faithfulness. And he dies with that great work of his life unfulfilled. And he doesn't seem less because of it. I actually have greater respect for the way he sets down that work and it goes unfinished. And so I try to say to men, uh, I give the intentional practice of Sabbath as a check mm -hmm. on ambition, uh, which today we define Sabbath as, well, if I rest one out of the seven days, I'll get even more done on the other six, which I think yeah. is to miss the entire point of Sabbath. <laughs> it's not to recharge you so you'll be more effective. It is an intentional choosing to only accomplish six sevenths of what I'm capable of accomplishing. Wow. What does that mean to only achieve six sevenths of what I might be able to in life and mm. to carve out that fraction so that I don't outpace God, so that I don't mm. become frustrated by this goal or this ambition, but to leave that intentional space for God to speak and lead. Um, I remember a few years ago, I was listening to a lecture talking about Jesus's transfiguration in the, the Gospels, and it was nothing about Moses at all. Uh, but he made he was talking about which mountain probably the transfiguration happened. And then he mentioned, of course, Elijah and Moses being there on that mountain. And it just struck me that in that moment in the New Testament, transfigured with Jesus, Moses was actually in the promised land. He was in the land of Israel. Wow. Yeah. But it wasn't out of his own ambition, his own energy, his own leadership. It ended up being by God's grace. That thing got completed, not by his effort, but through God's grace. And so it's a reminder to myself, I'm, look, if you had to force me into one of the five instincts, ambition is probably the one that's strongest for me. I'm a pastor or a writer. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I imagine the things I want to accomplish and get done. So what does it look like for some of that, what I could imagine to go unfinished? And what does it look like to leave intentional margins in my life so that I don't outpace God? And what does it look like to entrust those things ultimately and finally to him and not just my own effort? Mm -hmm. And that's a, a word I'll say for women too. We struggle with that as well. Absolutely. Um, but what a thought, like, do I have the discipline to leave some things unfinished? And as you're describing that, even in Moses's life, but also I think in our own lives, when ambition is out of control and out of balance, it often leads to anger, um, like being frustrated at your kids or your spouse or your or your coworkers that you're getting in the way of my progress, um, and it's it's not reflecting well on 
the success I want to have. So yeah, Dietrich yeah. Bonhoeffer has a little book called Life Together about living a Christian community. It's uh, a lot for pastors, but I think every Christian should read it. And he talks about, there's this is really shocking line in there where Bonhoeffer, which Bonhoeffer, of course, was the German theologian that opposed mm -hmm. Hitler and would ultimately yep. be executed by the Nazis. But he, um, he writes this little line, God hates visionary dreaming, which feels like everything I learned as a Christian pastor was about... <laughs> vision and leading yeah. a congregation towards it. So to read Bonhoeffer say, God hates visionary dreaming. Uh, but he goes on to say that what it has a tendency to do is that it makes the dreamer proud. And he sets up his dream, his vision as the goal for the whole community. And he starts demanding things of others. And whenever it fails, he first blames the people around him, which this is what Moses does. And then he begins to blame himself. And ultimately, he blames God. Mm -hmm. And the way this the unfulfilled ambition in my life can actually, as you're saying in anger, set me against the people around me, can lead into this personal despair and can ultimately break my relationship with God. I mean, in the end, I want God. I don't want to just mm -hmm. have done things for God. I want God. And if yeah. that means setting down something of this ambition and entrusting it to him, that's a far better thing to do than to achieve that great thing and lose him in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I feel like the next one is very closely tied to ambition, and it's a lot of what fuels, I think, ambition, which is reputation. And uh, this is an interesting one. This is one that I'm not a man, but I'm a woman, but I've wrestled with this. Like you hear sort of conflicting advice in the scripture. Like I was raised in a family that really emphasized how a good name is so important. And as Proverbs says, it's more to be desired than than even gold. So um, good a good name is not a bad thing, but yet we're so warned of pride. And um, when rep reputation begins to become the one thing that we don't know how to surrender. So, uh, and I love that you used the example of David in this and how you describe like the difference between uh, kind of fighting for a reputation versus being vulnerable enough to actually have a testimony. Yeah, I love Shakespeare's definition, his little image of this one, because he describes the man uh, uh, starting to to wear the clothes that he's expected to wear and cutting his beard the way that he's expected to, to cut it. And he actually says he's begun to put on a little weight. Uh, this is that stage in life where you've achieved something and now you're interested in how it's perceived by others, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, uh, I make the same point in the book that you do as well, too, that uh, we're encouraged as Christians to pay attention to our reputation because it impacts our witness. Uh, we're right. supposed to live with a good reputation in the world around us. But David's story is a fascinating one because David becomes king in, uh, in the world of Saul. Saul is made king by the people's choice, if you remember the story. Mm -hmm. And they take one look at him and he's tall and he's handsome. They look at him and think that's exactly what we think a king should look like. And that's enough to make him one. Whether he's capable of being one, they're not really interested in. They're interested in the outward appearance. And really Saul's story in, in my reading is him crumbling under that pressure. He cannot take the fact David is gaining a reputation instead of him. And he sort of goes mad with these expectations, this weight of living up to being king by his image alone, his achievements alone. And when David becomes king, he's very much, I think, tempted by that. Uh, and there are times David does this well. Uh, he, Saul tries to put his armor on David to go out and fight Goliath in this image of a warrior. And David, I think, rightfully recognizes, no, I just have to be who I am. Uh, but there are other times David gets this really wrong. And of course, one of those is his his sin with Bathsheba, but particularly the cover up of that sin, mm -hmm. yeah. where David is really managing his public reputation. He's just mm -hmm. trying to clean it up. And it's such a sad moment when Nathan the prophet comes and lays out this little story. In the Hebrew, it literally begins basically like once upon a time. Like it's very obviously it's a, it's a story. And as a reader, you get right away that this man who has many lambs but steals his neighbor's only lamb to provide for this banquet, you see right away that this is David, what David has done, stealing another man's wife for himself. But David doesn't see it. He condemns the man. This man should be put to death. And in so doing, condemns himself. And he doesn't see it because David in the trappings now of his power and becoming king has become so absorbed in this reputation, this image of himself, that he actually has lost touch with who he is. And I like the word uh, integrity, trying mm -hmm. to pursue integrity as a check on reputation. 
Because we sometimes think of integrity as sometimes the definitional here is you, you do the right thing when no one's looking. But I don't, I don't think that's the right definition. The right definition of integrity, integrity comes from the idea of an integer or a whole number. There's mm -hmm. no fractions. There's no missing pieces. Or we'll talk about the structural integrity of a bridge, right? There's no cracks in the foundation. Uh, this is a whole thing. And that's the pursuit of our life is that our lives are meant to be lived as a whole, which means not that we won't ever do wrong but we're willing to integrate the wrong that we do into the image that we have of ourselves, into the reality of who we actually are. And David, for all that he does get wrong, he does this in a pretty remarkable way. And, and perhaps the best testimony to this is just how much we know about David. David leaves us his Psalms, many of which are his own confessions of those sins. And he leaves us First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles, which narrate all of the painful realities of his own brokenness, how it plays out in his family. And look, we live in a time where politicians spend millions to hire lawyers and image consultants to cover up all their sins. Mm -hmm. But David, who very easily could have struck down the chroniclers, who very easily could have burned the books in his own psalms, he chooses to leave us this full confessional testimony of his life for good and bad. Because in the end, he has this kind of integrity, not that he always does what's right, but that he's willing to integrate all of who he is, good and bad into one, one presentation of himself before the Lord. And I think that's the right way of thinking about reputation. It, reputation doesn't mean I'm always right. I always do the right thing. I'm always perfect. A good reputation means I'm willing to be honest and a whole person. And there are things I confess only to God and a spouse, and there's things I'm willing to confess publicly, and we manage that life of confession. Uh, but before God, we're willing to be a whole person. There's no fraction or piece of our mm -hmm. life that's swept under the rug or tried to work out of our identity. And men are particularly bad at this, I think. We compartmentalize. Yeah. If I can yeah. win and be really good in one public area of reputation, then I imagine I can sort of ignore everything else in my life. And that leads to this kind of lack of structural stability, <laughs> integrity, mm -hmm. and eventually things begin to crack and fall apart. Yeah. And while that can be a pitfall in any stage of life, I like that you're, and that Shakespeare put it like towards the end, because I think when you've got a 25 or a 30 year old guy who's struggling with something, he may feel more of an openness to be vulnerable. But if you're talking about like somebody who's a spiritual leader or like a pillar of society or a father, uh, and he's at the place where he's thinking, I should know better than this. And if people know this about me, I'm going to lose all that I've gained. Um, so the, the stakes become higher at this stage of life to live with, with integrity. Yeah, that's really interesting. David, you're right. In his youth, gets this right almost mm -hmm. spectacularly, right? Yeah. But the moment he, the crown is on his head and suddenly he's God's king appointed by God, now all of a sudden this test of confession of being a whole person becomes so much harder. Yeah, the moment a man has experienced praise mm -hmm. in any way, I think all of a sudden the discrepancy of that thing, the the untruth that people mm -hmm. don't see becomes harder and harder for him, not only to confess, but to even reconcile with himself and right. God. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So apathy. Uh, why apathy and why is this one last? So uh, again, Shakespeare has a great image here. He t describes the man in his slippers, sort of knocking around the house. Uh, he's what we might imagine in his retirement years, right? Uh, he actually, it's a very interesting phrase. Shakespeare says that his voice has turned to, to pipes and whistles. And it's not just, certainly there's a sense as we age, our voice changes, we lose something of the, uh, of the volume of our voice. But Shakespeare is doing something symbolic as well, too. He's describing our kind of, our engagement with the world, our speaking into the world, that we begin as we age to retreat from things. Uh, there's this scientific idea of entropy, that mm -hmm. given time, things become more disordered and more chaotic. And I think all of us know what it is to spend a lifetime trying to hold it all together, right? Uh, uh, the side of my house needs to be stained again this spring, right? There's always some chore that I'm thinking about has to get done. We're holding these things together. And there does come a point in our lives where that work, I think, can get exhausting. Or we feel like I've done enough I've kept enough together. I've got enough of a retirement account. Now it's my final opportunity to sort of relax or just be apathetic about things at once. Perhaps I was engaged in. 
And I use the story of Abraham, which is surprising. People are always surprised because Abraham is our model of faith, right? Abraham is the one who leaves home and travels and follows God and out. You know, we talked about adventure. It is this epic life of adventure, pursuing God into this thing that he doesn't know ultimately where it will lead him. But if you get to the end of Abraham's story, you read in chapter 21 that he has signed peace treaties. He's finally Isaac, his, his son that he's been waiting for has been born. He settles in Beersheba. And there's this great little symbolism that he plants this tamarisk tree. So he puts down roots in Beersheba and he seems to sit down beneath this tree. And what you imagine is uh, now the story goes from Abraham to Isaac. Finally, he's arrived in this place and peace is his and prosperity and the heir that he's been waiting for. But I actually think it's the greatest moment of risk in Abraham's story, because up until this moment, Abraham has had to live by faith. And while Abraham still believes in God, in this moment, when all everything's been secured, the promise he's been waiting for is finally fulfilled in there. Why does Abraham need faith? He does, he's not living in faith anymore. He's settled down. Everything he's wanted, he finally has. He may have faith. I believe God exists. But this act of living and walking and following by faith, that seems to come to an end. You turn the page into the first verse of chapter 22 in Genesis, and you read those famous words, but God tested Abraham. And it's in this moment that God calls Abraham to take Isaac up to the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice. A lot could be said about this passage and has. It's one of the hardest passages of the Old Testament. But to me, there's something going on with God is awakening Abraham back into this life of trust and faith. Abraham will say, even if God should raise him from the dead. And I've always loved that word, even. There's this certain ambiguity that Moses, or excuse me, that Abraham is being asked to act into. And it's that ambiguity that breaks apathy. He has to care and act by faith again in this test. And so I try to say to men, if you find yourself in this moment where you're having a hard time engaging anything, caring about anything, checking out from things, where you've imagined, I've worked hard, I'm going to relax some, I'm going to vacation a little more, there's nothing wrong with a vacation, there's nothing wrong with retirement, right? These are not bad things. But if they become the disposition of your life, the disposition mm -hmm. of your life is to coast and check out and apathy, you're actually at your greatest moment of risk because you risk that faith disappearing, that active faith in your life. And I think God calls us all to these acts of sacrifice, to these tests of sacrifice. And so um, as a pastor, I'm particularly interested in that generation of men that are retiring and the way that they could give and continue to serve the church. And we really need people not sort of checking out, but stepping into those things in new ways with new callings and new sacrifices. And those might be at, at a different pace. Mm -hmm. Obviously, our life is paced differently as we age, but we never, we never outgrow. We never end this process of following God and listening and responding by faith to what he's calling us into. And to Abraham's credit, he does that in a pretty remarkable way. He ends as this character of great faith, because even yeah. in that moment, he picks himself up from under that tree and follows God into this, even if ambiguity, this sacrifice, and we get this great testimony of God's faithfulness because of his faith mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, when I've observed this in people who are in those latter years of life, one of the things that I've seen, and I, I love how you said this, is that they're facing the greatest test of their life. But often it's really private. So, uh, and often it involves the loss of something. So God is asking Abraham to let go of Isaac, to give this up and to trust him. And for a lot of, uh, older people, particularly older men, like they're letting go of their influence and of their position and, um, letting go of their health, uh, letting go of their dignity. Uh, and these are private battles of, you know, will you still cling to me? Uh, and be a man of faith, even even when these things are stripped of you, uh, which I don't think anybody's really talking about. Like there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no books or or pa pastors or help. Like, how do you do that well? Uh, and how do you both step into risk still and say, okay, I still want God to use me, but also let go of the things that even biology and, and life phase are asking you to let go of? Yeah, this is one for me, too, where I actually think there's some value in, in recognizing how our culture is leading towards a certain apathy that might not also be be related to age. 
Um, mm -hmm. I think as we, there's this Irish saying that for every mile of road, there's two miles of ditch, right? There's mm -hmm. a ditch on both sides. Mm -hmm. And as we talk a lot about aggression in men, this is the kind of critique of toxic masculinity. Men are too aggressive, too assertive. I think there's another ditch we often don't talk about, which a lot of even young men are swerving into, which is this ditch of apathy. Well, yeah. if the world doesn't have a path for me or a place for me, then what's the point of caring anymore? Mm -hmm. And the number of young men who are checking out, who are feeling apathetic, who are giving up on sacrifices of, of relationships and family and career. Um, I think there's a real challenge of apathy for men right now, just culturally, regardless of age as well, yeah. too. And no, so you're this right. is a particular one I'm, I'm trying to have a, a broader conversation yeah. with men about. We, we, we have to be willing to continue making sacrifices yeah. for the sake of our own faith and our engagement with the mm -hmm. world, even when at times it feels like somebody might not be interested or there's not a place for that sacrifice in yeah. this culture. No, I feel like as I'm looking at this list of sarcasm, adventure, ambition, reputation, it's almost the young man who refuses to fight that battle, each one along the way. Like he starts with sarcasm, doesn't fight that battle well, and then sort of gives up on adventure, gives up on healthy ambition, gives up on reputation, like very quickly and just ends up settling on apathy. Yeah, I think that mm -hmm. that is happening for a lot of young men. And I think we haven't given men, uh, we haven't called them to a life of meaning. We've sort of uninvertently said men are the problem. <laughs> men is everything that's wrong with our culture. And perhaps there's times and places that's been true. Men's behavior have not contributed in positive ways. But if, if we don't hold out a positive view of why we need men and what men can be, this isn't an equal sons game between men and women. We need men to engage. Mm -hmm. uh, then I think we're reaping what we've sowed culturally, and that is a lot of apathetic men, and there's very real consequences. You see that in the Bible, too. I mean, the, 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 the wrong that men do is not just through violence in scriptures. It is, after all, Abraham himself in his youth trying to wait for this heir, Isaac, that ends up producing Ishmael, this other son. And when that blows up tension and drama in his home, Sarah comes to him and says, Hagar's, you know, there's drama, Hagar's rubbing this in. And Abraham says, you deal with it. Mm -hmm. He just checks out of this relationship challenge that he himself has created. And so there are very, and that of course has long-term implications for, for Ishmael. Um, there are very real consequences when men slide into apathy and disengage from these callings. And we don't often, I'm afraid, recognize those challenges that we're facing uh, in men too, that apathy comes with real costs. Mm -hmm. Now, this book has been out a couple of years now, and you've gotten to see uh, men going through this uh, through groups or just one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Uh, what have you seen? Like, what happens if men take this journey seriously? One of the things that has really surprised me is I've done a lot of men's groups. Uh, I've talked to a lot of uh, men's groups that are reading the book. We'll do Q&As. And I wrote this book partly because I was concerned about particularly Christian men and, and our engagement on these issues. Um, I found myself over the last couple of years becoming more and more optimistic. All mm -hmm. of the news headlines are around what's wrong with men. Uh, nobody covers the good things that are happening within churches around men. And the thing that has shocked me is the number of men who are willing to step forward and say, I just want to do and learn whatever it takes to become a better man, to become a better follower of Christ. And I've done, I've done these Q&As with men who will do Zoom calls at nine o'clock at night, because at nine o'clock they can get the kids to bed and mm -hmm. they can gather with another group of men and they're having these conversations around these things. And so I have found myself actually becoming more encouraged it requires us, and I've been saying this to a lot of pastors, it requires us to actually engage these conversations with men. We can't back away. We have to actually create this path for men to do this work. But there is a deep hunger. I think most men, uh, I use the word malaise in the book. Most men know something is broken. They know something isn't working. They know that what they've been given as a cultural narrative isn't leading to a fulfilling life. And I think men are extremely open right now to the idea that this pursuit of Christ and Christ likeness can produce those things in their life they want to be. Most men do not want to be addicted to pornography. They don't want to be in broken marriages. They don't want to repeat the cycles of broken fatherhood that were that they experience in their own. They're lacking a path or a way to become something more than that. Or they're lacking people who say it's possible 
-hmm. So often the message we give men is you're just destined to be in your armchair playing video games. Men are just perverts and broken. Uh, but to be able to say to men, there is a path to grow and bear greater responsibility and become more Christ-like. Men are responding to that. And I'm actually really encouraged about, I think it's going to happen in ways that don't make headlines. You're not going to see it in the news, but I think that's happening in a lot of places. And I've been encouraged by it. 